I believe I have what is rather disappointing news. I think it's good that you're being picky, finally. You're babbling like a little fool. Go to your room. I can't sit in front of the TV all day. He was so handsome. And no one never gets a vote for her. Nobody else is saying the right thing about this. What is going on? What are you saying? You did everything they asked you to do, but you don't owe them anything. You can't even hear me right now. My mother was crying and praying so hard. There wasn't room for anyone else to feel anything. Welcome to Mad Men Men, the weekly show where we discuss a show that used to come out weekly. Each week, we take a close look at an episode of the AMC series, Mad Men, which ran from 2007 to 2015. We're changing the conversation of this show all of these years later. Where one of us is a first-time watcher, one of us went through it one time back when it was airing, and I watch it every time I get in the mood to take a drive around Dallas, Texas, which is a lot. I'm John Agroni, and Will Ashton, what is going on? It's a good question. For me, it's just a nice... Cold November day in 1963. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary so far, other than the the, uh, the heating system doesn't seem to be working in this staying office. <laughs> Fittingly, we're recording this in November. Uh, oh, and hey, look, it's Mike Overholse. Mike, you look so happy and satisfied. Is that because you just got back from a nooner? You know, that and I was hanging out with my friend Jack Ruby. He owns his hip new club <laughs> down the street. Welcome to the show, guys. And uh, we were talking about one of the pretty pivotal episodes of Mad Men, uh, The Grown Ups, which is season three, episode 12, uh, directed by Barbe Schroeder. Uh, I think this is Schroeder's first time directing. Uh, he's known for some films and such. And uh, I, I was going to ask, put it to you quickly, Will. I know he's kind of a pretty famous director. It's it's kind of amazing. We're talking about one of the French New Wave directors. Uh, I'm most familiar with his work uh, in The Peanuts, uh, you know, playing the piano and all that. He said his name's Schroeder, right? Barbie Schroeder? Yeah, I think that's pronouncing yeah. it, right? Okay. Yeah. Just checking. Guys, this is dynamite. We I are. Know. This is... You're killing it. I, I thought... I thought Will knew more about <laughs> famous auteur director. Uh, well, let me Barbie look at Schroeder. his filmography. He, he was, he was like, working alongside, like, Godard, and uh, he, he... I don't was, doubt it. I'm just saying I, I'm looking at okay. his filmography. Com- Will, you're starting to yell. Okay. And Mike, that now you've made Mike cry. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, no, he's, he's made some beautiful little movies. Uh, I would say that uh, one of my favorite ones is probably Reversal of Fortune, um, but also Barfly he made. That, uh, is oh, I don't need to see movie. Barfly. Yeah, the Mickey Rourke one. And, uh, you're, anyway. You're well, he, made, uh, he, he made a single white female. He did, yes. Yeah, uh, that's like early 90s. Yes, that um, classic uh, French and white film. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Um, so he was, he didn't direct in the... The French New Wave. You're just saying he was around for it. He he worked alongside those directors. Oh, okay. I see. He his career started in the '60s, so he came like a little bit later into it. Um, so he did do uh, he worked on like Six in Paris and stuff like that. But uh, I think one of his more infamous movies from that era was uh, More, um, which I, I think was like his first like full on film. But anyway, uh, he's directing this episode, and he's a, he's an interesting choice as a director for for Mad Men, I would say, considering his connection to the '60s. But as I was saying, this is the this is the episode that covers the JFK assassination, and this was a pretty monumental episode for Mad Men. It was an episode that people had talked about for years up to this point since the show kicked off in 2007 are they going to do the jfk you know assassination are they going to cover it how are they going to cover it by the time we get to season three it becomes pretty clear that like all right well they did the cuban missile cuban missile crisis they did nixon versus kennedy i mean how could they not right it's in 1963 they show that margaret's wedding is the day after earlier this season all the pieces were in place but uh people weren't sure which episode it would be right and so it was kind of interesting that this was the episode that like kind of starts off you're not totally sure right until it starts to become clear like okay yeah this is the jfk episode um it was uh written and co-written i should say by brett johnson and matthew weiner uh, i had the chance to listen to the commentary with those two and blake mccormick who is one of the producers uh producers who work on he mainly works on like post-production but yeah this is this is a big episode for the show uh big ratings yeah go so ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I was a little sidetracked there. Uh, you said something about President uh, John F. Kennedy? That's right. What about him? That's, how's he doing? Well, well, you watched the episode, you know. Well, what do you mean? I, I just know that you know it's another beautiful day 
in uh, you know cold America in the sixties. I don't see what what the big deal is. I, I'm assuming there's something with uh, maybe the Cuban Missile Crisis or something going on with uh, with John F. Kennedy. What, what was the thing you were saying there? I guess what you're trying to say, Will, is that while you were watching this episode, you didn't realize that we were getting J. JF- like, when did you realize this was JFK? At what point? Like, was it? Well, I'm living. On? I mean, I know this is John F. Kennedy, but what about? He's assassinated Will Ashton. You want what? Me to say it out loud? What do you? Okay. What? Since when? Your acting is so good. Well, now you're making me feel bad for being shocked that the president Mike, can you of, say of this? the United like, States. <laughs> Mike's just sitting back and watching. Out <laughs> <laughs> <Bad> here, brother. <laughs> this is what I thought last week's episode was going to be. <laughs> That's right. Last week we came into it with no preparation and uh, whatsoever, and uh, yeah, that's how it happens, huh? Uh, like I was saying, the ratings hit one point seven eight, which uh, the, so far this season one of the higher ones, not the highest of the season, uh, not at all, but uh, definitely one of the higher marked season uh, episodes of the season. And funny enough, guess what? Guess what day this episode came out in two thousand nine? November twenty second. November first. So we're oh, literally wow. recording it. Yeah, we're literally recording this fourteen years to the day later. Um, which we did not plan <laughs> at all. I feel like this has happened once or twice before too. I don't know how how it happens. When you well, all are just like John, you take so long to release these episodes. But when we do release this episode, it won't be on November first. To be fair, where were we fourteen years ago today? Uh, well, that was two thousand nine, and uh, I was like a week or so away from my nephew being born. Will's just wow. like huh, I have one of those. I just turned fourteen, prime of my life, sexual prime of my life, I should say. And I uh, what else? What was that? Eighth grade. Probably had a big test coming up. Looking forward to uh, winter break. I was in college because, uh, you know, it's 2009. And uh, I was having a good time. I think it was like my sophomore year of college or something. But anyway. Oh, no, this is my freshman year. Freshman year. Um, okay. Uh, I don't think Will wants to discuss where he was in 2009, which is why he's being Oh, so I'm, just, I'm not indulging in any of your bits because you didn't want to indulge in mine. So why why should I care? Your bit had no verve. It had no sort of that, like... You could have made it work if you had fun with it. If you played along, it would have been good. But now... Feel, no, because you can't yes and something like that because it was a little bit too on the nose. And look, now you're making hmm. Mike so uncomfortable. Um, Mike, if you want to log off, that's fine too. I'll think about it. Mike, why do you think this episode is called The Grown Ups? <sighs> well, John, when a mommy really loves a daddy... <laughs> And he invites her to a hotel in the middle of the day. Yeah, yes. And, and that daddy sees that mommy is not going to want to be there anymore. She sees what's on the TV. So he has to turn it off. That was based on a true story, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, so Bob Levinson, a little early piece of trivia for you two. So apparently Bob Levinson on the show told Matthew Weiner about a guy who had an apartment like once a month, kind of like in the movie, The Apartment. And he had this girl, she would like come over every once in a while. And it wasn't like a thing that he could always count on, right? So like she was like coming over and he literally unplugged the TV. He had just found out that the, that the president had been shot. So he was like, oh, shoot. And so he unplugged the TV so that they could still, you know, do the hanky pink. That's real. To answer your question, originally, I always kind of had this idea that it was kind of commentary on like the loss of innocence that the United States had in the wake of JFK's assassination. It feels like we get catapulted into a much um, less idyllic um, phase than maybe the 50s were and what the late 60s and 70s are going to be like. Um, But I got to say, after reading the chapter on this in Mad Men Carousel, I got a couple other ideas, but that's always what I had thought of my own. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll add something to that. Um, In the commentaries, Weiner mentions how that was that's like the typical narrative with the 60s of like when you get to the assassination the loss of innocence is like the term that people use and so he and uh, and Brett Johnson and, and their team they kind of they did want to find another way to tell this story that was different they were like how can we sort of go beyond that so he talks about how you know one th- one angle he had never seen before at least at this scale when people talked about JFK was like how TV played into it and you know he he were marked on how like 9-11 was something that they had lived through. Uh, 9-11 had only happened eight years before this episode came out. And uh, at that point, and so he remembered how like during 9-11, everybody was glued to their TVs. The way that everybody responded to it was so just like, uh, it was a cataclysmic event. And he said that even though they didn't live through JFK, like uh, Weiner was born in 1965, they were able to kind of like use 9-11 as like an emotional anchor in order to to draw upon that when like writing these episodes. Uh, so I thought that 
was pretty interesting. Uh, I guess I took the title as more ironic in the sense that like a lot of the characters we focus on are people who either kind of masquerade as adults or, you know, have some sort of stunted, uh, you know, arrested development kind of thing. Like, Certainly we've talked about that with Betty, like this sort of idea that like there's a part of her that still never really fully grew up. And like, I guess you could say that the uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy was what kind of uh, made her more clear eyed to the world. But at the same time, there is this kind of thing where she's like in, you know, the the parking lot with Henry. And it's kind of just mirroring the, the boyish girlish kind of thing that was going on with, uh, Glenn back in season one or season two. Yeah. Uh, well, season, no, season one. This season is the one. end of season one, yeah. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, we have uh, Roger's daughter kind of, you know, ostensibly becoming an adult by getting married, but like still throughout the episode acting fairly childish, at least leading up to the wedding. She sits on the bed uh, and her feet don't even touch the floor. Right. And like, you know, like calling dad and like getting sent to her room and like all this stuff. And uh, I, would, I would argue too, like with, with Betty again, like the way she looks at Henry, it's almost like she kind of looks at him as like a father figure. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I think you touched on that. But also, uh, I yes. feel like Pete is always also kind of just masquerading as an adult as well. Like even at the beginning of the episode, he has like this kind of, you know, he's like shrunken up. He's like holding his hot chocolate, not like coffee or tea or anything. It's like this kind he's of eating a drink. big bowl of food that almost looks like cereal when he right. walks in on him. But yeah, like um, he still feels like the sort of like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I want to say entitlement, but there is that sense of like, he did work hard and he did like appeal to the clients, but like he still feels entitled in some respects. Like even though he's known that this is, uh, you know, a two man operation that like, you know, one or the other was probably going to fall down the ladder at some point. Uh, I think he just kind of innately assumed that uh, he would be the one that would rise. But this is the third uh, time, though, he's lost out on the job. Right. Sure. And I think he's being hit with the realization. And, you know, you guys are a little bit younger than me. So, like, you probably haven't experienced something like this yet. But I certainly have. I know people who have. But there comes a point when you reach like you start to get into your 30s and you start to realize that, like, you could be hitting the end of the road in terms of, like, how far you can go up the corporate ladder. Now, I'm not saying I've directly experienced this because I'm the boss. But no, I'm joking. Um, But no, like, there is an anxiety there. There is a whole sort of like, you know, sometimes you can be great at your job, but you're not going to go anywhere. Like you, you get to a point where you're like, oh, this is it. Like, and I think Pete is going through that. It's not something I ever recognized until I rewatched the show a couple of years ago. And I was like starting to go through that for the first time where I was like, man, can't I, you know, ascend to that next level or am I going to be kind of stuck? And I think like, it's not something you really experience that much in your twenties. Uh, maybe you guys have experienced it to some extent, but yeah, it, it's something that I definitely see more in Pete now. Like I see it in Pete way more now than ever. Um, but, uh, might yeah, I was gonna, be like, yeah, I definitely don't relate with that. I'm in charge. Well, I was just obviously. gonna say before I let Mike speak that uh, Trudy also it feels like in some ways sort of regresses with the uh, the assassination of Kate. Like she was a more like thoughtful, pragmatic of the two. Like she was the one that's just like, well, you still have to like you know keep appearances X Y Z. But then when JFK gets assassinated, like her perspective of like how the world should run and operate is kind of shattered. So she's like, you know, what? we're not going to go to that wedding. You Isn't know that what? funny, though, that like <laughs> they end up being the most functional, stable couple in this episode? Sure. But they, they also feel like they're emotionally sort of regressing at the same time. I kind of uh, argue with you there, but um, I also want to know what Matt, uh, my, I won't call him Matt, what Michael thinks. Uh, I'm, yeah, I would argue with Will there as well. But, but yeah, before we get into it, I was, uh, I don't know what I was going to say. Um, probably something super insightful. I've really lost track because, I, oh, I remember it had to do with, with Pete. Uh, yeah. it's, it's just, you know, it's the more you watch Mad Men, the more you, you get older. Again, it's the more you realize that Pete Campbell is the most uh, relatable character on this goddamn show. <laughs> He, yeah, he, there's a feint with his character. It's like you think that he's so despicable that like you couldn't relate with him. But then like, yeah, that's why it's so it's kind of annoying almost. It's like I don't want to identify with Pete. Like, I no, <laughs> he's a child. He sucks. Because I feel like I'm on the preci- precipice of that experience, precipice of that experience. Uh, and but I, I, I already am feeling the anxiety. And if I didn't get the job three times, like so much of my self-worth would be down the drain. And, you know, it's, yeah. you know, cause who are you at work if you're not always climbing or, you know, getting more money, getting more power, getting more influence. If it's just stagnant, what do you, you know, 
It's, yeah, you could read that into the whole idea of like they they literally go back to work like on that Tuesday, the Tuesday after the president's assassinated on Friday. And like there's a lot of biblical stuff you can read into that. But also like it, it's a very unique thing um, for Americans because like in other countries, like when something kind of similar to this happens, they shut down for like a while, sometimes like a whole week. And Americans just didn't. They were like, OK, well, we're going to have a day of mourning on a Monday and then it's back to business as usual because it's like that constant American corporate grind is always a priority, right? And and so like this, yeah, this episode even kind of subtly gets into that. I don't even know if it's intentional, but uh, it might be. Yeah. I mean, even when it happens, right? Like how soon afterwards of Jackie pulling the skull off the back of the limo, do we get a shot of them in Air Force One, right? S- swearing in Lyndon B. Johnson. Yeah, we, we have the Pablo Lorraine movie for that. <laughs> Um, I, I do want to just call some attention out to like how great the details are in this episode, like the historical details um, and the commentary. Brett Johnson, the writer, was also one of their head researchers uh, throughout the show. And one thing that was his job was like down to the weather. So like how cold it was, how hot it was. Like there, there's this like little touch they include in those early scenes where the building doesn't have heat. Right. And they're all like wearing these clothes. And at one point they they talked about maybe in their office, like in Lane's office, somebody talks and they would have like a breath, like a foggy breath kind of thing. And. And the, I think it was like Brett Johnson, who was just like, no, nah, it doesn't make any sense because it wouldn't have been cold enough that day. And so like, that's kind of like where the show is operating or how the show is operating. It's really cool to see. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think to what you were saying about like Trudy regress or like Trudy and Pete regressing, I, I get where you're coming from there, but like, sure. so, so I, I'll, I'll bring it to something. So this is Matt, what some of Matthew Weiner said about the episode. He said, um, the way he interprets it, his own writing, uh, they wanted to answer this question of like, who are the grownups? You know, who's going to take responsibility and be an adult when this terrible thing happens? And you can kind of extrapolate to like some of the comments he he and the others make of like one of the anxieties that people were feeling during this time kind of mimics what was going on during 9-11 and where like our institutions were failing. And it created this like mode of like patriotic panic where people kind of were feeling like we want to believe in our government. We want to believe that everything's going to be okay, but we are also sort of feeling like something weird is just going on. Something like we can't, there's no authority that we can trust. And that sort of like cynicism and questioning of like, oh no. I, I can be complacent. Um, there's no such thing as like, you know, the world is fine like because I'm in my bubble and everything's great. It's a very sort of like neo, you know, not neoconservative, I guess just like basic conservative Rockefeller who we hear his voice at one point, 50s kind of like mentality. And when we see Pete and Trudy, they're, they're the only characters who are kind of being more liberal. They're, they kind of have more the attitude of like, yeah, this, this system is fucked up. There's inequality. Like it, nobody's, you know, looking at this the right way. And so you you can kind of see like they're not very pro- they're not progressive people but you're sort of seeing like the birth of like the baby boomer neocons essentially um in pete and trudy that's not to say that they're not regressing but i think they're the ones who are the most like they're, they're farther along and kind of getting that this is all a sham and i think it's egged on by the fact that pete sees that like he can be great at his job and he can do everything they ask him to do and still the corporate life is not going to satisfy him it's not going to bring him what he wants and i think it's a sign that he's maturing in a sense because he's no longer chasing you know the some like random american dream that he was told to accept and so yeah that's my argument yeah you kind of touched on it but i just think it's their their perspective is the one of the 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 people who are promised the American dream and they've done everything they're supposed to do. He's from the right family. He married a girl also from a good family, but same, I like same name as his sister-in-law <laughs> time and time again, though, just like it has failed. Like couldn't have a baby. Didn't get yeah. the job. Like all these things. Right. So I, again, the most relatable, it's like to, to, to oh, the baby. Yeah. That's a really good call out with the baby too. I mean, Trudy and Pete are certainly the healthiest relationship here. Hell, I'd even argue that, uh, Roger uh, doesn't like his marriage uh, is more of like a father daughter sort of thing yeah. than like his real relationship with his actual daughter at this point. Like he's more you know emotionally mature with her at this point than uh, with his actual wife, and you know we kind of see that uh, in the two scenes that we have with or three scenes we have with with her and them and him. Uh, you know, like one is like her kind of pouting uh, and locking herself in the bathroom. The other is her like watching the TV wedding. in the other room yeah. and then like also being carried to bed like a kid, you know, well, that's uh, why I love that they found time to have that scene with Joan because yeah, it's, that's the f- it's the first time in the episode where it just seems like Roger is being himself and he's actually like talking to somebody that who's like an adult, right? This is how I felt. Well, outside of his ex-wife, 
I'd say. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like he and Mona also have like a real connection, but it feels sort of like he can't quite reach that with her because of all of the the sure. baggage that they have. But I feel like with him and Joan, I don't know. There's just like no sort of like there's not as much weirdness between them. Sure, she's a lioness. <laughs> I I would like to make a note for the listeners that we aren't saying that Pete and Trudy are healthy. No, just no. the healthiest. <laughs> it's a, comparative. Yeah, 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 point. He he raped someone like four episodes ago, and she just swept it under the rug. So let's just be very clear there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, did um, she? I forget. Was she aware of that? Uh, I think she's aware that he cheated okay. and yeah, the way that they got, a, I think the way that they grappled with it was that they made like a silent deal where okay. he doesn't like how, who he is without her. You around. can never leave me here again. You need to take me with you. Jeez. But yeah, I mean, there, there's so much that happens in this episode. I, I want to run through some things that, that kind of stuck out to me. And uh, I, I want to, I don't want us to miss out on Peggy's roommate who shows up again. Um, I don't know if you, either of you forgot that she exists, but uh, Carlo Gallo is uh, the actress, I think, who plays her roommate. She shows up for a quick scene. We find out that like Peggy is still kind of like doing this thing with Duck. And uh, I was kind of curious about this because like, you know, it is kind of weird that like she only just like pops up like twice <laughs> so far this season. Um, um, I don't even remember if she's in the next episode, but uh, maybe she is. But yeah, it's kind of weird because she's, you know, Carla Gallo. She was like pretty big at this time. So uh, actually in the commentaries, they mentioned that they wanted to do more stories with her, uh, with like Peggy and her roommate. But other storylines, particularly the ones with Peggy and Don, took up way too much space. And also the actress was too busy that year. But it is kind of interesting because like if you if you know that and then you're like listening to the conversation they have, you can kind of see that they now have like some kind of like established back and forth between the two of them that does sort of feel like they had stories in mind. So it feels like a missed opportunity. But, you know, what are you going to do? She's just too big of a character. Peggy just has so much going on. So it makes sense that they have to kind of prune and pick and choose. But it does feel like a, a good amount gets kind of lost in the shuffle. I would say so. I would say so. Um, so uh, it yeah. sounds like the way you two are talking about her, that she's not really in the show much after this. Well, she could be, and I could be forgetting Will Ashton. How do we know? She's I'm in it. All I said was this season, Will Ashton. They do reference, uh, to Mike's point, they do reference Sal's go- being gone in this episode, which I thought was nice. Because I feel yeah. like, kind of similar to Poochie, this whole time they should have just been saying when Sal's gone, like, where's Sal? What can <laughs> we do to help Sal? I hope Sal's okay. Someone check in on Sal. How does Sal feel about the Kennedy assassination? <laughs> does Sal also think that Sally is behind the, the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald? Um, yeah, but no, uh, I definitely, uh, and, and by the way, for the listeners who are kind of like, wait, did Will text you all that while he was watching the episode that he thinks Sally did it? Your answer is yes. Um, yeah. well, no, hold on, hold on. I never said she did it. I'm saying she has a good alibi because <laughs> she comes out just when that happens. But I'm not ruling her out yet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't we know. need to rewatch the Zapruder film and just yeah, see. Yeah. You see Chauncey in the background, like mm. <laughs> Sally's riding him. I am. I am glad like they, they they leave room <laughs> for the conspiracy theory stuff. Um, on that note. Because even at that time, like as it was happening, people were sort of like speculating that something weird was going like something was amiss because like it just seemed like kind of like how Pete is regarding the TV in that moment, like it doesn't seem plausible that like he, that they would just like be so like lax with the security that it would be possible for someone to be able to assassinate the assassinator, the assassin. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Not assassinator. <laughs> I do uh, appreciate that every time we see the TV or not, maybe not every time, but a lot of times like the transmission's kind of funky. That could just be them trying to honor the time. But I think that also kind of adds to like the, uh, you know, disorientation that we feel as we're watching it just kind of like, is this really happening? It almost feels like you're in, cause it, it, there is something kind of dreamlike about the episodes you're watching it. Yeah. Like you're, you're, you're kind of like walking into like a, a waking dream. The and editing is kind of weird. To, yeah. It has, especially the first like 15 minutes, like yeah. it's 15 minutes before the assassination starts to like reach people. Mm-hmm. And yeah, up until that point that there's like some kind of choppy editing going on. Yeah. Like sort of graceless editing. It just kind of cuts to like a, a different subplot or whatever. So, but it builds anxiety. Like the more you watch this episode, the better that gets because you know, what's coming. And I think it's like, it really stands out in a good way. Um, also, I think we've, we brought this up before, but for, anyone who might have forgotten or I don't remember for sure if we brought this up, uh, the way that they do the TV stuff is like those old TVs like are always 
off. Like they, they're not actually playing anything. They're using special effects. They're like doing it after the fact. So that's why like, you know, we can easily speculate that that's what's happening with like the transmission kind of being funky and them trying to honor the time. Like, like you're talking about, well, uh, because they do have the technology, right. To do that, even in, uh, 2009. Although I have to say I, there's a, a moment in it where they are in the apartment, like Pete and Trudy, and it's like their apartment. It's, it's when, um, she finds out that he didn't get the job and everything. And the lighting is pretty bad. Like I, in both, uh, I watched this both on digital and on uh, DVD. And like, you can really see like the lighting, like it's so obviously like not New York in that window, especially with the lighting of her face and everything. So I think something kind of went wrong there. Like they're trying to make the whole episode feel kind of like cool and grayscale. And it has this cool effect, but th- there was like that one scene that I feel like I could nitpick and be like, that really took me out of it. I was like, this is being filmed in Pasadena. Yeah. After reading the, uh, again, the Madman Carousel chapter on this, uh, his, his argument is that basically this entire episode is, you know, a statement on like life moves on, life goes on. And uh, I could see that editing, you know, especially as, as you called it out, that it's mostly choppy before the assassination is just kind of coming up like that's like what was life like before this you know it's you always think about that in tragedies of like what were we even thinking how like you, you think of it in that choppiness and then it's just everything after that is it's in the light of it yeah it's, it's more, more uh, disparate that way like you kind of like like there's not as much rhyme or reason to it just kind of like you think about the little insulated moments as they happen or as you think about them I think that's why it's brilliant that it, this is tied with the implosion of Don and Betty's relationship because Don wants to move on. He just wants to keep going and not like accept that, you know, this new reality and to like have this create some kind of change for him or anybody else. He just wants to get past it. And Betty's like, we can't like, you know, like what's done is done. And like, that is like the ultimate stopgap of their entire dynamic is that she just refuses to pretend like you know to go along with this game and it fits her character in the sense of like she like pete she's become disillusioned with like the fantasy that the american dream told her you know and promised her this past year of the show alone like she's lost so much she's lost her dad you know she is like found out that her husband is totally cheating on her uh, not cheating on her, has been lying to her and cheating on her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I do appreciate that, as you're kind of alluding to. Uh, like, throughout the episode, Don rarely watches the news or watches the TV or hears it. Like, he often turns and like turns it off or, like, looks away from it. Or, like, even in the office, he's, like, totally aloof to uh, what's really happening. We don't really see – we don't get to see him learn about the JFK assassination. But, like, we're constantly watching Betty – watching TV, seeing and learning about the death of uh, JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald and all this stuff. And it's a nice sort of way of kind of like showing, you know, Don trying to be in the dark, kind of being, you know, uh, keeping up the fantasy of day-to-day life where as Betty is seeing the facts, seeing the war, like what's happening in very stark black and white ways. Very true. Very true. There's the whole thing where everyone's kind of finding out, like you're saying, uh, like kind of in like slow motion. There's that scene where Don is kind of arguing with Lane about like hiring an art director. It feels very in media res. And so I, I was looking at some like reviews of the show, like this episode when they came out and people were kind of complaining of like that felt kind of weird. And then in the commentaries, it was funny. It was actually like Vincent Cartizer and John Slattery and the other commentaries. who were kind of saying like, yeah, that kind of that's confusing. It's like, Oh, I remember they shot more of that and like more of that conflict between the two of them, but they just never filmed like, or they never uh, put that out. So like, it feels kind of weird that like comes out of nowhere that Don is mad at lane about hiring an art director. And I guess like the, I guess the intention was that like, we're just sort of like in the middle of business as usual. And so like everything just kind of halts, you know, and, and we don't need all that extra setup, which I can kind of buy. It doesn't bother me as much. I don't know. I, I took that as like I think you were kind of alluding to it, but like how seemingly arbitrary everything is, like prior to the assassination, like the fact that we don't really see that whole struggle. Uh, and then it's like, like all it, trivial. And then like there's another sort of dreamlike quality as far as the art's concerned. Later, when Don's with Peggy, and like it looks like there's like an ad of some sort that would have been very similar to the assassination, like even down to like the same like. Like it looks like it's like almost That's like colorized, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like colorized version of the uh, of the footage. In it's a way, the same it's thing just, that happened in the last season with Marilyn Monroe. 
sure. and like her dying and then being like, oh shoot, we can't, <laughs> you know, we can never use that ad that we thought right. about for Playtex or whatever it was. But, I don't know. I feel like this one, like that sequence is oddly like darkly funny, just in the fact of like how but he turned like, it over. similar it is to the JFK assassination and Peggy still being like, oh, in a month, people aren't going to, you know, worry about that. <laughs> you know, yeah. And Don is just like, what do you got? <laughs> Great moment. Um, I think I, I know you kind of mentioned Will like in our group text that you kind of you were kind of like uh, okay with no Don and Betty in the first part of this episode, maybe the whole episode. Um, why is that? I mean, I, I get, well, I kind of get it, but I don't know. I feel like this season, at least, or maybe it started with last season, they've been kind of teasing the idea. Like, obviously, season one is very Don focused. It's about like who is Don Draper and who is he in relation to Dick Whitman? Who is he? In, in relation to the American ideal and, and the shifting cultural landscape of the early sixties. But then like, as the show has progressed and we get to see and interact and learn more about the other characters, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of expanded the world a little bit, gives us a better idea. gives us a broader cultural perspective of uh, this time and place. But also like, I feel like this season has been so Dawn focused that like, we really like, I was thinking about when we, like it starts with, Pete in this episode, I was like, oh, we really haven't, maybe it's just because of how long it's we've taken to watch these episodes, but it's just like, I feel like we haven't really seen Pete in a while. Like, if we have, it's like very briefly for like a scene or two, like in the last few episodes, we haven't really had a Pete-centric episode. And likewise, I feel like Peggy has also been kind of in the corner and like Jane, we haven't really, you know, interacted with much at all this season outside of, uh, you know, her getting married to Roger and whatnot, but uh you know, it just feels like, oh, okay, this is an episode where it's just like the B-sides, where it's just like, all right, here's all the other support characters and like what they've been doing when Dawn's life's imploding. I thought that would have been interesting. But uh, I don't know. I, I also just like when shows do that. Like when uh, Man Seeking Woman, there's like every, there's always like one episode uh, in that show where it's just focus on Jay Burchell's sister. Uh, and it's always really like some of the best episodes of that whole show. Or just like it's not even about like the main character, it's just like like a different perspective entirely that I find really fascinating. But I thought that would have been pretty progressive for the show uh, back in like two thousand nine or ten or whatever it was. But yeah, I can see why obviously Don and Betty are in this episode. And I don't know, maybe they do something like that later on. You guys would know better than me. Did you have a similar reaction, Mike? No. <laughs> Mike. Mike was just like, I wanted more Don, more Betty right now. Well, this is the end. This, I'm, as you guys know, and I mentioned the past episodes, I went on. A, I went on. I went off script from how we usually handle the show, and I went on a episode binge starting several episodes ago. And this is where I end it. Um, which you think I would go to? I mean, the next episode is the end of the season. Yeah, I'm actually kind but, of surprised because this is the hardest one for me to not just keep going. But I feel like this is I, you know, this is the night's darkest before it's dawn, and I feel like it's oh, this it's is dawn. the finish of the arc of what I, I just get so excited about the reveal of what's in the box. I get mm. so excited about that dynamic of Don and Betty because for three seasons, truly, like this, that is what the show like. I feel like if you are only watching up to this point, I feel like it's this and like. Is Peggy like Peggy? I guess it was Peggy already telling uh, Pete about the baby, right? I feel like those are like kind of like the two big things. Maybe fans of the current time are like those are the the storylines, and so it's just good. And and so I'm I'm more than happy w- with it. Well, what if I told you that the next episode, which is called "Shut the Door, Have a Seat," is one of my top five, maybe top three favorite episodes of the whole show? How well, would, how would you react? It's one of the highest rated episodes, right? Like on IMDb, isn't that like one of the top? Two highest rated episodes. And I mean, you tell me. I don't, I don't wanna. wanna. <laughs> I know it's like really high. It's like a 9.7 out of 10 or something. Like it's really high. It's like it, that in like a Breaking Bad episode. Yeah, like Ozzy Mandias or something. <laughs> it's pretty fantastic. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a Stone Cold classic. Um, yeah, no, uh, this this is a big episode coming up. And so you'd think that like this is the episode that like this is the big ticket, right? Penultimate, you know, this is like all, you know all bets are off because like last season it was the mountain King was the big episode. Um, although arguably meditations and an emergency, the finale last year kind of broke that formula a little bit because it kind of was also a bit pivotal, right. With uh, a lot of stuff going on with, um, you know, will Don and get Betty get back together. But then the first season really like Nixon versus Kennedy was the big climax, right? The wheel was sort of the emo- emotional 
resolution. I won't tell you, Will Ashton, how what that makes this episode coming up. But I guess we we can stay, of course, on uh on uh, this episode for now, right? Are you uh, suggesting that they yeah. operate on the Game of Thrones rules? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Game of Thrones definitely stuck to that pretty pretty closely. Uh, with like uh, the ninth episode is always the big one. Bojack the Horseman. Finale. I remember it always like the eleventh episode would always be like the big one, and like the like twelve was always like the epilogue kind of. Yeah, it's it's something that's become more common over the last 20 years uh, i would say uh, maybe I, would like you, 15 because sopranos wasn't really like that no. if i recall no don't you think and i may be getting to the weeds here it's because of the the state of television and and um and like uh streaming services where you literally have no idea when your show's going to be canceled or off the air so you kind of have to have that emotional resonance at the end of each season just in case that's the last you get that's a compelling theory yeah i like that a lot um yeah, um, I I think like just that, just everything that's going on in this episode, kind of bringing it to like watching so many people just sitting around watching TV. Were you all thinking of nine eleven? Because I know our ages are a bit different. I definitely was old enough to remember it in pretty good detail. I was eleven years old, um, or actually I was like ten going on eleven, and uh, I was like going to turn eleven like a month or something, and. I remember it pretty closely. Like I, re- I remember watching the news all day. I remember having that same conversation with like my parents of like, you know, stop watching this. Like uh, my dad didn't want to wa- us to watch it constantly. They pulled us out of school. There was just like total, like just a total shift in like the mood. Like everybody was affected by it in my surroundings at least. And there was also a lot of like weirdness happening. And so, yeah, I'm kind of curious if that was kind of similar for you guys, because I see you can definitely tell in this episode that that's where they're drawing from. Yeah, I was uh, uh, I was sorry. Little baby good. I was six. Um, and so my perspective and I resonate, you know, with the, the, the children, um, it's you. I could I remember. So I remember coming to my mom's room as she was getting ready for work um, and just we I'd always hang out with her while she did that. But instead of being in the bathroom, where she usually was. She was on the bed watching TV crying. And, uh, but being so young, I couldn't really understand what was happening, but you Mm. could tell that things were fucked up, but no one, no one would explain it to me. No one was getting into it. And so it was like, and I was still being forced to go about normal life, but you could just tell that it was like, this isn't normal. Yeah. Yeah. I could definitely see that. Uh, Will, you're, you're kind of in between our ages, our ages. You're in a bit of an age sandwich. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like I... I don't know, I guess similar to, like, Sally and Boppy in this episode. Like, I was aware, but not aware. Like, I, I knew something was happening. I knew, like, that there was a, it was like a day of sadness, a day of mourning. But, like, like similar, Mike, I don't remember anyone really explicitly just saying, like, what happened. It was kind of more like Don's, like, you know, protect the kids. Like, you know, keep the TV off. I feel like that was my, uh, the adults around me, that was their way of kind of reacting to 9-11. Yeah. Unlike Mike, you weren't asking if you were going to be going to the funeral, you know? But also, like, I just remember, like, I don't know, I know other people, like, left school or, like, like school shut down. Like, I remember just going throughout the school day. Like, the like kids left. Like, I remember, like... That's actually surprising, considering... I mean, so you, you were Pittsburgh, and so, like, you're... There, Suburbs, there was the yeah. whole United 93 thing, right? So it wasn't, yeah. how far away from that were, were you? Uh, I think about two hours from that. See, that's closer than, because for us, like Pentagon was close because I grew up in Virginia. So it was, that that was like four hours. So I'm, and they pulled us out. Yeah. It's like, yeah. surprising. No, I mean, I just remember, I mean, unless I misremembered, which is us. Mike, Mike was safe and cozy over in Washington state, like some kind of liberal or something. I don't know. West Coast, best coast. <laughs> yeah, he was like surfing or some shit. Like, all right, well, that's enough nine eleven jokes for for this podcast. We'll save the rest for later. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think like watching this whole thing, and especially it, there are just some darkly funny moments in here that do kind of remind me too of like there were dark jokes being made back in two thousand one. Believe it or not, um, I was in middle school. I remember like I was I was around some rap scallions and then some. But, uh, you know, there's a whole scene where, like, Margaret's in her wedding dress, and they're watching the TV, and she's crying. And it's pretty darkly funny, right? And, like, she's just like, it's ruined. <laughs> and apparently, uh, so Weiner said that, like, from the beginning of, like, this season, he wanted to, like, have that moment. Like, it, a lot of this was leading just to that visual, uh, which I find, again, pretty darkly funny. 
but um yeah yeah i think um there, there's something to be said too about like uh, brett johnson kind of commented on this he was saying that like unlike betty he's not halted by what's happening you know he he's ready and he's trying to like move beyond it like that's how he is and uh one of the reasons that like he's able to just kind of like brush it past is because he's been through so much trauma so that kind of made had me wondering like you know don's trauma it, his coping mechanism how he differs from betty and so like and it almost makes me wonder like if the show is saying that like his method is the wrong way because he's not reckoning with what's happening or if it's like well also what, what betty's doing is not that commendable either because she's so naive because she is kind of like her. She's the one whose innocence is breaking. So there's like a weird nuance there. It, it's sort of like at times I'm not quite sure who to side with. Cause I feel like both have certain like are ill equipped for this situation in their own ways. So like, is it just come down to like Pete and Trudy supremacy? I'm, I'm a bit lost on that one personally. Yeah, it feels like they're both ignoring it in their own way, one by completely ignoring it and not caring about it, and the other one by trying to, like, run so far away from it or, like, dive headfirst into something else that, you, you, like, it, it j- drowns out the, the pain or the numbness from the actual thing that's happening. But both are not actually confronting the, the actual event. Yeah. You know, almost like their own marriage, something about Mad Men always not actually being about the thing it's about. I think I think it's clear that like Betty goes to Henry at this point because she feels like she can't trust Don and she can't trust the systems in place. So what's left? You know, this this guy who is a bit older than her, who was sexually attracted to her even when she was pregnant and promises to take care of her. So, like, is it that simple? You know, I do like the call out that the dude is horny for her with the baby bump. You know, respect. He was. I mean, that's how I, I don't know. Mike. Actually, I'm going to ask you, Will. I mean, where are you at oh, with Henry at this point? Do okay. you, are you okay Thank, with him as your new stepdad? Like, I was very afraid you were going to ask me about my feelings on submarining, which I was very happy to not discuss. Cause, submarine? Uh, uh, well, well, don't you remember, um, what's it, the guy was at the debate that everyone liked, and then he got like his Reddit page found out, and then he was like really into like pregnant women, and like oh. a, it was a fetish of his. What's that guy's name? That's a kink name, Subarini. Uh, yeah, what's the name of the guy? Uh, Couldn't tell. I, I, I don't. John I didn't know this Boner. was a controversy. I thought this was just oh, like people Ken Boone. Were... Ken Boone. That's it. Yeah. Oh, oh, from forever. I'm thinking about our current like. If anything, I, I no, know, like a nominee. Yeah, I was no, no. no. Remember when like Ken Boone was a thing, and then he was like, America's first... sweetheart for like two days. Right, and then then right, it was like, oh, we'll do an AMA, but he used like his actual account. And then, like, people looked at his history. He was, like, really into submarining. And people were like, oh, I thought you were just, like, a sexless weeb. I didn't realize you had sexual interest. I didn't that realize you had Riz for days. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, wow. what was the question? <laughs> 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 Henry Francis. So, Will, um, are you okay with Henry Francis being your new stepdad? Um, he's a little square. You know, like... I don't know. He seems a little too... Uh, he just doesn't have that Don charisma. Like, he's definitely a safe bet for Betty. Like, I get it. Like, I understand why they're together. Or, in the sense, of, like, they're, they're palling okay. around. And I love that shot of uh, the two of them, Don and, and Henry. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I texted you guys. There's, like, the in the Vincent Cardheiser and John Slattery and Allison Brie commentary. <laughs> They, literally so betty walks out of the bathroom and they're just like who's she gonna choose <laughs> harry cray <laughs> like surprising everyone. i thought that was pretty funny um yeah no um I, I i've never hated henry ever i've always just been kind of indifferent to him the first time i watched it i was kind of just like come on man like that's our boy, Don. Yeah, yeah, Don. He's the best guy around. What about all the wives he cheated on? What? Cheating. <laughs> Mike, your audio like corrupted itself while you were trying to deliver that. that I line. don't get why that happens. It's your voice. It's very loud. It's God just stopping That's me why from exclaiming. Like yeah. <laughs> what cheating? Um, it's the government yeah. trying to suppress our Ken Bone talk, I think. <laughs> pretty late to it um but yeah what about you mike do you because i feel like the more and more i watch this show 
the more I kind of, I'm really kind of just chill with the guy. Like, I don't like him. I mean, I've got loyalty a, for Don. The dude's a fucking saltine cracker, man. I think, I think he's the best representation of just w- the embodiment of a stepdad. Like, all right, mom's happy. He seems okay, but he's not my fucking dad. <laughs> That's true. But I mean, there's still the question of whether or not, you know, is Betty really going to go through with this, right? Is she going to to go along with this guy and bring him into the, the home. So that's going to be the big question coming into the next episode. And I, I just, you know, I, I want to give him a little, I want to cut him a little bit of slack, which is a first for me. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Will with our boy, Henry, do you think this is going to work uh, out? I don't know. Maybe. Hmm. I don't know. I think Betty just wants something safe. I think she wants something where she can trust her husband and I don't know why she thought to do that with a politician, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's Betty. I mean, yeah, it is kind of funny. Cause it's like Don has that kiss with her and stuff. And like, he is so like suave, right? He's her age. There's always like a, a sexual connection, but she also has this kind of like fantasy that goes beyond the physical, with Henry, it's like she didn't want to just have an affair with the guy. You know, she didn't want to just like sleep with him. Like she wants something else. And so that, yeah, it, it's, it does make you wonder while you're, especially while you're watching the show for the first time, whether or not that's going to be enough for her. You know, I mean, once you've had Dick Whitman, I mean, how do you, you know, there's no Dick Francis that I'm aware of um, that she's going to enjoy. I don't know. Um, the wedding itself is so cringy. I mean, it's just so like Roger trying his hardest to kind of like give this like speech and like, I don't know what you guys think, but like watching him, he's just kind of sweating and he's kind of, he's doing it in a competent way, but it's almost like it's too competent. It's almost like the reason like Pete doesn't get the job. It's like he's overcompensating for something and it's so obvious and it feels like the whole crowd is kind of pity laughing the the entire thing, especially that line where he kind of is like looking at them and he's just like, you know, if you can get through this, like marriage will be a cakewalk. And it's like, I think that's why this, this episode really hits a high for me when he like cuts all that bullshit out and just talks to Joe and just be like, this shit is fucked. And like that to me is like mad men. It's like that cutting through the bullshit. How would you feel if I told you that I thought the wedding went smoother than I anticipated? <laughs> <laughs> what did you expect? I mean, I, I thought it was going to be well, like people crying and like, like I thought it was going to be like, atrocious like i I thought like Mm. uh you know it seems like they were trying to keep up affairs you know roger called it a nightmare but i think Uh, like disaster he called it a disaster yeah yeah which like i mean that makes you wonder like it's almost as if because like they all know that it wasn't exactly what it was supposed to be it's still a disaster or i don't know well, I can see it being a disaster for him specifically, right? Because he's Roger, so he has to be like the jester of the event. And so yeah. the the emotional toll that took on him to have to, you know, he's all about presentation, especially when it's something he's putting on. So the fact that it was his daughter's wedding, like really, especially in that day, right? It's more about the father of the bride than it is about the bride uh, in, in a certain sense. Yeah. And uh, so he probably wore the, the wore the brunt of that. Yeah, it's just like he can't reckon with it emotionally, like what's going on with his daughter, because he just isn't able to. Like the world isn't letting him. It's it's kind and of tragic his in a way. Child bride wife gets so fucking drunk that he can't lean on her. He can't go to his old confidants because of what you've already brought up and all the yeah. weathered baggage between them. So who does he have? Red. <laughs> I just love the delivery you did there, Mike. <laughs> Very earnest. Um yeah, I think I think that's spot on. And I, I also wanted to shout out Bert Cooper in the kitchen. Oh yeah. That's another like call to like who are the grown ups? Like Bert is like in the back watching T V. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Um, but uh Ken Cosgrove's in the in the kitchen as well, right? Yeah, and it's kind of interesting seeing him and Jane in the same like room. Sure. Because of like all that yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. stuff. Well it uh, seems like but, there's definitely when he leaves, you can see that there's a little tension there, but uh, oh yeah where he's just a little bit like all right i'm out of here yeah, like, yeah. He, yeah i'm not wanted um th- and the, hey by the way we skipped over the part where ken is like you know kind of helping out a secretary with the heater and uh you know well you know when he does stuff like that like very helpful very nice it's almost like he's kind of a nice person i was you know what i mean 
The main thing I noticed with that is that he's the only one in the office that's unfazed by the cold. Like he's just hey, he's from normal. Vermont. Oh yeah, that's nice right. touch. yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's a good point. That's the show. Meanwhile, how does Harry Crane respond to the president being assassinated? Just worrying about fucking work, that piece of shit. Well, he's well, worried about losing does, money. Right. Doesn't that tie into like why Pete is kind of like morally outraged? He's kind of like righteously indignant indignant about like you know, he says to Trudy of like the things that people were saying. I'm assuming a lot of that was probably from Harry Crane. I also think it's a nice touch that, uh, you know, he's like the head of TV accounts with the one time that this, you know, cataclysmic TV thing's happening. He's like not watching it. Like he's just like, yeah. it's on the background, you know. Because his friend is like trying to get a therapy session right. out of him. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, I love that shot too of, uh, you know, just how it's like very simple, but there's that dread. You see the bulletin, and it's like you know, like even if you don't know, you you know, like what's happening. Like you you, you just you see it, and you're just kind of just yeah. waiting for them to find out. And it's just like, look at the TV, you dummy. It's like you know, it's JFK just died. What are you complaining about? The head of accounts for, it? but you know, Matthew Weiner kind of mentioned how they really wanted to have this like uh, organic process when it came to Betty and Henry. Um, so didn't want to lose that, but. Uh, like the way that she's like drawn to him, so like him showing up at the wedding, they thought would be perfect because Roger has always been the connection between Betty and Henry. That's been brought up again, you know, because of course they met at Derby Day, which was Roger's party. And so that's where it started. So of course, like, you know, this is like the culmination, right? Their big kiss, their big moment of like, maybe we can really make a go of this happens like after they reconnect uh, once again for like the fourth or fifth time, like they haven't met that many times um, over the course of the season. Right. But uh, this is, this is the big one. There's, there's even that moment where uh, she uh, is like relieved to find out that his date is his daughter. Um, yeah. That's a great beat. That's a, that's a really great beat. Cause at first too, like you're thinking like, Oh, you know, he's just like, you know, and all these other guys, he just has all these other young women he, he's going after. Well, if, Honestly, so the last episode, The Gypsy and the Hobo, that was a big acting showcase for John Hamm. This is January Jones's episode. I think that she is the most fascinating character to watch, just like from an acting basis. Because, like, yeah, like that that expression that flits across her face when Henry shows up, um, the moment like she is like staring at Don and like he doesn't know, like while they're dancing, just the the wave of emotions, the way that she is just like lost in all of it. Like, she is just, like, bringing it all home. You know, the, like, what is going on, like, you know, when she's yelling at the TV, when she tells Don that she doesn't love him, and she sits down on the couch and looks up, and she's just kind of, like, relishing in the fact that she finally did it. Like, she is just phenomenal in this episode. Just brilliant. I still don't like Betty, though. (laughs) I mean, that's the thing. Betty and Don are not likable characters. But, like, I love them. I love them anyway it's it's strange um that's 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 the business do you do you love these characters will do you or are you still kind of like where are you at hung up on sal yeah that's what it is huh i think they're just you know compelling characters you know like i don't think about them the same way i think about like sopranos like with tony soprano i'm like this guy is objectively a monster but my god do i love this guy like he's just he's fantastic it's like with Don, it's like He's intriguing to me. Like, it's not a matter of if I want him to win or lose. It's just like, well, what's he going to do? Like, uh, like when the chips kind of, you know, go, like go against him, like, what, where, where is he going to go? Like, what, what persona is he going to adopt? So, like, it's more, it's more, uh, strategy I don't know. How long did it take you to get there with Tony? Did you always feel that way? Oh, I think it was specifically, uh, well, I was going to say a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, I keep forgetting we can't really talk about Sopranos here, but um, I, I would say for me it's like around the end of the second season is beginning of the third maybe when like uh, I start to really love Tony. Oh, uh, for me it's when he's with those ducks in the pool, baby. <laughs> the first scene, the, yeah. the, first episode, <laughs> the second. Well, that's uh, the first episode. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I asked just because, you know, if you're saying, you know, you're not exactly there with, with Don yet, I'm just wondering, you know, are you a guy that just takes a while to warm up or, you know, at this point, should we just not expect it out of you? But it sounds like maybe the, the jury's still out. Well, again, I just don't really see, like, he's not like Walter White to me. He's not like an anti-hero that you root for, I think. He's more like you watch him 
uh, like a studiously, you know, from a. I'm rooting for Don. I'm big time rooting for Don. Okay. I love. I I I, I want all of his affairs to work. I want him to be the best at business. <laughs> and... I want him to keep ignoring his kids. <laughs> On it, truly, like he goes to Palm Springs. I go to Palm Springs. You know, I I like I love Don. I just have a couple things left, and we're we're all done here. The the big moment where Betty tells Don that she doesn't love him. It's again fantastically done uh this is how matthew weiner describes it he says that betty is feeling nihilism when she confronts don you know this whole like what's the point like it doesn't matter uh and don is uh he's trying not to reveal how devastated he is by this that was their intent and he claims that their relationship comes down to love and she doesn't expect to fall back in love with him and uh Concurrently, Vincent Kartheiser talks about this too, and in the other in the separate commentary, he kind of mentions that like there are relationships where they're past the point of being saved, and that's like where Betty is with this relationship. Like she just doesn't think that it can be salvaged at this point, and she's finally like accepting that. Um, and then back to Weiner, he says that he wrote in that whole thing where she sits on the couch and is just like you know her body language like that was all like part of the script it was all very specific to the performance down to like when we see don finally letting himself feel what happens they use a music cue that is really similar to the one they use when he finds out that his brother died in the first season so i thought that was pretty fascinating and, and definitely very specific to these characters in a way that you know after last episode, I mean, we had so much big emotional stuff happening with these characters to see in this episode, like it's not over. It, it's really fitting, quite honestly, because like we're finally getting the real fallout of that massive revelation that's been building up since the beginning of the show. Yeah. And also just like a lot of mirroring, like we didn't really even talk about. And this is something that's uh, discussed in Mad Men Carousel is, uh, you know, comparing this episode to the uh, guy walks into uh an adage you see or whatever that episode uh, is called uh yeah. like that is you know uh, a symbolic recreation of the uh candy assassination right but, when like, you guys put in the door right uh yeah so you know it's just fun saying like like th- like you know like, like the little cues like you're there obviously like throughout but then like the, the, again like that sort of dreamlike quality where it's just like you know like you can kind of premonition you see things premonition wise like before they actually happen, but like the characters are just totally oblivious to all that. It's pretty fascinating. By the way, when uh, we get to the point where Don uh, meets up with Peggy at Sterling Cooper, we kind of touched on this already, but uh, the whole thing with like Aquanet, uh, Weiner also mentioned that uh, they didn't know that it was going to be Aquanet. Um, that when they like, they knew they were going to do like this commercial with people in the car, and eventually they landed on it being an Aquanet ad. Um, but yeah, that was also something that like from the beginning they had been planning. And then in terms of the song that they go with at the end, it's perfect. I, uh, he mentions that like that song, that specific song, The End of the World, um, was on the charts that year. And they picked it because it was a song where it felt like that adolescent, you know, speaking to the theme of like the grownups, uh, that adolescent feeling like, you know, you don't love me anymore. Uh, literally, like the first time I watched this episode in, I think it was like 2012, I, I genuinely like was on the verge of like weeping watching Don, you know, just like that song come on. I downloaded the song and I still listen to it all the time because um, it's a haunting song. And uh, I know Mike's giving me this look of, like, don't forget to mention it's on one of the Fallout games. You can listen to it there. Um, yeah, I almost forgot. Thanks, Mike. Welcome. And also, this was kind of surprising to me. Um, at the end of the commentary, Matthew Weiner admits that there was a big debate over the, over whether or not they would do this, whether or not they would do the JFK assassination at all, and whether or not they would have this big falling out moment between Betty and Don. And that kind of surprised me because I always sort of assumed it was a given. Like, of course, like it was all sort of, you know, I mean, it's kind of an interesting reminder at how many decisions get made at the creative level. Uh, and that it's kind of a humbling thing for, to be sure, because I can't even imagine an alternative, you know, compared to like the way that things worked out with the show. But we still have one more big episode to go. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited to talk, to talk about it with you guys. Like, I, I genuinely can't wait to rewatch this episode and find out uh will's gonna be like shut the door have a seat who's having a seat better be chauncey so uh i I know this might be spoilery territory so i understand if you don't answer but who would you guess has also like all these characters would have been around to see the jfk assassination and 9-11 besides like sally and bobby 
we would assume, right, like, we're not going to give anything, like, these are characters who could die or something like that, right? Sure. Um, so we'll, we'll put that aside for the sake of not spoiling I was, anything. I would say, like, if, if you're like me and you don't know anything about what happens, yeah, yeah. like, who would you assume would see both events? Well, Dawn the first, strikes me as somebody who would live old. First man out would be Pete's dad. Sure. <laughs> Pete's <laughs> dad, planes. <laughs> uh, Betty's dad, Betty's mom. Uh, yeah, I'd say Trudy. Sure, I think Ken Cosgrove would be is, is the first person comes to my mind. Uh, I feel like we're taking a personality test. If you pick Trudy, if you pick Ken, that means you, you have call a stigmatism. Your parents enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like Jane will see both. I mean, she's young enough. They have that whole thing where she's just right. like, I never even got to vote for him. Right. That was just too young. <laughs> I'm 20 years old. Oh, God. Uh, is there anything uh, left that you guys want to bring up? There's uh, one thing where, by the way, since he he's like carrying Jane over, there's this nice little detail where the Buccaneer is like, it looks like it's been totally uh, destroyed and they didn't even intend for that, but like they rehearsed mm-hmm. so many times that, and then they were like, Oh, that actually fits perfectly. Cause that is like realistic to like how mm-hmm. it would have gotten messed up. Um, I actually looked it up. So apparently the United, uh, let's end on a positive note. Uh, the Memorial for United 93 is actually 90 minutes from where I am. So it's actually shorter than, a positive than I think. Note. Yeah. yeah. That's an <laughs> interesting positive note. <laughs> Yes, I mean, like, if it's positive for Will, then I mean, yes, I guess we don't know what irony is the same way you guys don't know how to do a dang bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, with that, ladies and gentlemen, my goodness, <laughs> we'll see you all on the next episode of Mad Men. Men, thanks so much for watching and listening along. Uh, and uh, don't forget, of course. We do have a recent podcast episode that came out. Now, by the time you're listening to this, it will probably been out for a couple of years, but yes. Killers of Flower Moon, we had Mike on for that episode, and that's out right now. So, I mean, hopefully it's not going to be that long before this comes out. So, um, that was a good time. I think that episode turned out really well. Not going to lie. That was fun, yeah. That, one, that was actually one of our better episodes. And you know what? We I have, think it might be your best Mike, ever. We have Mike to thank for that. Mike did a great job. Thanks, guys. So sweet. <laughs> Hey, that was just a promotion I finally uh, I've always wanted. On that negative note, see everybody. Bye.